chapter 5. That's where we find ourselves tonight, 2 Kings chapter 5. I want to give you a message tonight entitled True Colors. True Colors. Um, there's a fellow in the New Testament, and probably not everybody's heard this name, but the name is Demas. Uh, his story is, I think, one of the most chilling stories in the Bible, but the verses about Demas are so brief, you might have missed them. Uh, let me read them to you because I can give them all to you in a nutshell in less than a minute. Here's what the Apostle Paul said at the end of his book of Colossians in the New Testament. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings, and also Demas. Uh, here's what the Apostle Paul writes in the book of Philemon, verse 24. He says, uh, well, let me start in verse 23. That's where the sentence begins. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. But when you get into 2 Timothy chapter 4, and you're in the last chapter that the Apostle Paul is ever going to write, and he says words like this, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. Right after he says that, he says, make every effort to come to me for Demas, having loved the present world, has deserted me. When you hate it, if God saw you as a Demas, one that started, but fell back, fell away. Loved this world more than you love God. Instead of staying faithful to the end and with God's man, you abandon him for the world. That's Demas' testimony. But there's a lot of Demases out there. Uh, there's a danger that we can be kind of lulled in to thinking somebody's one thing when in later on they begin to show you the true colors and you realize it's something completely different. Uh, people's moral and spiritual colors get exposed over time sometimes. True colors get revealed. You start to see them for who they are. Uh, that's what happens in 2 Kings chapter 5 in the Old Testament. An Old Testament version of Demas is a fellow by the name of Gehazi. He was the right-hand man of Elisha. But listen to how the story goes. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 20. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, Behold, my master has spared this Naaman, the Aramean, by not receiving from his hand what he brought. And as the Lord lives... I'll run after him and take something from him. Now let me remind you of the story where we left off last time. Naaman was a Gentile who was also a leper. You have a long chapter in the book of Leviticus. Longest chapter in that book. Maybe the longest chapter Moses wrote. And it has to do with uh, leprosy. And maybe the second longest chapter is right after that that talks about what do you do if God cures the leprosy. The best I know, there's two people in your Bible in the Old Testament that got cured of leprosy. One was Miriam, and the other was Naaman, a pagan Gentile. But God didn't just heal his body, God saved his soul. And when God saved him, Naaman, coming from the pagan background, tried to offer monetary payment and other gifts to the prophet to thank him for this great work and to teach about the grace of God that's in salvation because it's full and it's free. Elisha wouldn't take anything. He said, no, what God's done for you, you can't buy it. It's a free gift. All you can do is receive it. 
and you can go. But this Gehazi, in the back of his mind, thought, there's an opportunity here. And my boss just missed it. But I'm not going to miss it. He was all about the money. So verse 21 says, So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw one running after him, he came down from the chariot to meet him. And he said, Is all well? He said, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothes. Naaman said, Be pleased to take two talents. So he gave him twice as much as he asked for. And he urged him and bound the two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothes and gave them to two of his servants, and they carried them before him. When he came to the hill, he took them from their hand, and he deposited them in the house, his house, and he sent the men away, and they departed. When he went in and stood before his master, uh, but he went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Is it a time to receive money and to receive clothes and olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants? Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. So he went out from, the present, from his presence, a leper as white as snow. Gehazi, for a time, was disguised. But if you had been paying attention, you might have picked up on a few tells. You know what a tell is. They talk about that. People that play cards look for tells. If you listen to Andre Agassi, famous tennis player from the past, he talks about how he used to watch tape of Boris, Be uh, Boris Becker, I think that's his name, I used to play and watch a lot of tennis when I was younger. Don't watch it much anymore, but they used to be fun back in that day. But uh, Andre Agassi figured out a tell. Boris, every time he would serve to a certain spot, he'd do his tongue like that to the side he was serving to. He knew where he was serving before he ever hit the ball, and he beat him. And after years, uh, Boris when Andre told him, he said, this is what your tail was. I knew what you were doing. He said, I used to tell my wife, it's like he knows where I'm hitting the ball before I ever hit it. People give you tells sometimes. Do you remember Gehazi from the stories of the past that we've already preached through? Uh, when a lady's son died and she's heartbroken and comes and falls at the feet of Elisha, Gehazi jumps up and pushes her away. Hey, get, get, get out. Don't trouble us. He has no compassion, no sensitivity, no discernment. Or when Elisha, after they, Elisha rebukes him and listens to the woman's story, says, take my staff and put it on the dead boy. When Gehazi gets there and puts the staff down, nothing happens. No spiritual power whatsoever. Possible tell. But, you know, people can hide things really well. You know, I think sometimes there are some things that you may see, but they don't really reveal true colors. Now, I'm sharing this with you tonight just to remind you that we need to pay attention not just to where somebody is, but where somebody ends up. Because I want you to be one that has discernment, that has your spiritual antennas up, and, and to understand that people fool you. We live in a day and time where followers of Christ who have put their faith and trust in the risen Savior for the salvation of their soul, those who have believed in Jesus, been washed in the blood, believe that He has died and risen from the dead, coming again, and He is the Lord of your life, will have people that will try to speak into your life, gain your trust, who are fakes. But sometimes it's hard to tell. Uh, some of the things that happen, sometimes a um, uh, person just being in ministry, is, is sort of a thing that many people, although in this day and time it's not so much anymore, 
But it used to be even more so that if a person was in ministry, almost immediately that person has gained someone's trust. Because most people would think, well, a person in ministry is not usually generally going to be a bad guy. You know, they'll, they'll say things like, well, how can he be in ministry and be bad? And so they'll start to uh, put their trust in or maybe even sometimes admire. Uh, sometimes because a person is seen or well-known, even that, the, the fact that you're before maybe a body of people and speaking into their lives, that in itself may sometimes begin to engender some kind of thought or admiration uh, just because, well, how can all these people be listening to him if he's bad? And, and you see, as I'm talking about this, this are, these are things that maybe were true in Gehazi's life that also could be true in people's lives today. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, he went to, and then they'll name the school. Well, that's a good school. And he studied under the name of a professor, maybe somebody that's well-known and popular, maybe known even uh, outside of that, uh, the academic community. But where you study and who you sit under doesn't necessarily mean you're like them, although people like to claim credibility that way. Couldn't that happen with... Gehazi, maybe having gone to a school of the prophets like we've seen before, maybe this is a man that studied under Elijah himself. Or sometimes people by association, who they work for and who they're around and the organization that they're, they're, they're a part of. Uh, sometimes that engenders trust and, and esteem. You know, here's Gehazi, a man that works for Elisha, the one that followed Elijah. But that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, it may be that someone in ministry could have served their community or served you as an individual because very often people in ministry do that. They, they have ways of uh, making an impact and making a difference. And a lot of times when people are in ministry, they're a part of things that are uh, maybe groundbreaking or community altering for the better. And it may be that Gehazi had done a lot of good things in his life for a while. And th this is the one that really could mess you up. And there's, there's more than this, but I'm going to stop with this one. It could very well be that when this person got started, whoever it is that we might be talking about, and we're talking about Gehazi, but it could be someone that you watched on TV, someone you listened to on the radio, a pastor that you used to sit under who was in the pulpit. It could be that when they started out, he was straight as an arrow but don't watch where they start. Watch where they end. True colors over time get revealed very often. God has a way of taking that which is not known and unseen and he reveals it. So here's this Gehazi and uh, he is now thinking because he's trying to figure out how can I make a dollar off this situation. So let's start to look at and see what some of the bad signs are that start to give away what his true colors are. Back to verse 20. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, Behold, my master spared this name in the Aramean by not receiving from his hands what he brought. So as the Lord lives, I'm going to run after him and take something from him. Now, this first one I'm going to give you has got several parts to it. But the first bad sign that you see here is that he's a rebel against his authority. You know, Elisha's his boss. And, and Elisha's made a decision. This is the way it is. This is the way it's going to be. But this man that's under him has decided, I know better than him, and I'm going to do it my way instead of doing it his way. Now, when you see people that are rebels against authority, that ought to be a sign you know, something's probably not right here. There's trouble brewing. Something is amiss. And so being rebellious against authority can be, a, a, you know, another tell, but it could be a sign that he's already crossed a line that he should have never crossed and he's starting to show himself. But I'm going to go a step further with this because Elisha's not just any old boss. Elisha is the prophet of God. Now, there's other prophets around, but I mean, he is the dude. Remember, he's the one that used to be Elijah's right-hand man, and Elijah has now gone to heaven, 
And Elisha, who followed him, has received twice this power of God, twice the Spirit of God that Elijah ever had. And so God is using him in amazing ways. But when he speaks, he speaks with authority as someone who speaks the very word of God. Because that's what a prophet is. A prophet is one who speaks to the people for God. Remember, it's, it's the opposite of a priest. What is a priest supposed to do? A priest represents the people to God. A prophet represents God to the people. And this is a prophet like nobody's ever seen before. He may, I don't know what it was like from Moses, but if there's anybody he can compare to, he's probably on that level, if not above. Because again, twice what Elijah had. So for Gehazi to go against Elisha's will and direction is almost akin to going against the very word of God or to go against this as God's prophet, God's man, is almost like going against God himself, which really he's doing. Because it's God's will that Naaman be discipled in grace by not giving this gift. And Gehazi just wants the money. The point I'm trying to make is that in this day and time, when you find people who claim to be men of God or in our day, very often women of God, who live and act and teach and preach contrary to the Word of God on a regular, habitual basis. Now, understand, everybody's going to fall short eventually. We're not looking for anybody to be perfect. But I'm talking about they teach contrary to the Word of God. They find themselves against the Word of God. They don't do what the Word of God says, and they teach others to also fall away and be different from what the Word of God says. You're going to know that person is a snake, is wrong, is false, it's not real, and you see the true colors. And so be careful as you listen to not only how people handle the Word of God and how they obey God, but even beyond that, you can even look in this verse and see that here's Gehazi saying, how does he say it? As the Lord lives, I'll run after him and take something from him. As the Lord lives, he's taking a vow in the name of the Lord. He's really blaspheming God because he's using the name of the Lord in vain. That's not, if you're going to take a vow in the name of the Lord, you don't take a vow that says, in the name of God, I'm going to go sin because that's what he's doing. You know, I promise in God's name, I'm going to do this thing. Well, what you're doing is evil. But he's so careless with the Word of God. Again, another clue in the way that he speaks about God and the way that he obeys God by not obeying God and not obeying God's prophet, uh, you're going to know that he's false. But then you can go to another level and think about how little he cares about the people he's supposed to care about. I mean, this Naaman just got saved. Uh, do you remember what happened in verse 15 of chapter 5? Naaman, uh, who was a lost pagan Gentile, said these words in verse 15. Behold, now I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. What an amazing testimony from a man who used to bow down and worship a false god in a pagan temple, and now he believes in and trusts in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's on his way to heaven. He's just gotten saved. And does Gehazi care a thing about him or does he care about the money? No, he, all he wants is what? To take advantage of him and use him to get something from him for himself. A sign. A dangerous sign. Elijah's, teach, Elisha's teaching grace. And Gehazi is willing to do what? Distort grace for his own advantage. You say, do people do that today? They absolutely do. Uh, they teach all the time things that are contrary to the word of God and that go, uh, they, they teach things like cheap grace. Do you know what I mean by that? Uh, you can be saved and on your way to heaven and not have to repent. That's what's commonly called cheap grace. Uh, keep on living like you want to live in your sin and in wickedness and evil and rebellion. Uh, just say the name of Jesus in a quick prayer and you're good. 
Don't worry about repenting. Don't worry about turning to God. Keep walking with the devil. Keep living in the world. Keep practicing sin openly, habitually. And you'll go to heaven. It's what's called cheap grace. There's a lot of people that teach and practice that. Uh, there's a lot of people that will teach you other things about money and giving that are not biblical and uh, try to con people out of their money. You know, there's a um, place in Mark chapter 14. I'm trying to get there. And uh, here's how it reads. Uh, while he was in Bethany, talking about Jesus, at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster jar of very costly perfume of pure nard. And she broke the vial and she poured it over his head and some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii. The money given to the poor and they were scolding her. You know who led the way in that? You know where it got started? Judas, another Demas. He loved the world and he loved money. He was false. He was fake. It was a business to him. He was a religious profiteer. It wasn't a calling in a ministry. It was a way to profit. And he was a thief and a liar, so he wanted to be sold and put the money back because who was in charge of the money back? Judas was. What was he going to do? He's going to steal from him. So he got everybody else all riled up over this, and Jesus said, what? Let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed for me. You always have the poor with you. Whatever you wish, you can uh, do good to them, but you don't always have me. Why does he say it? Because he's about to go to a cross. He's going to die in our place and for our sins so that we can believe in him and receive eternal life. She's done what she could. She anointed my body before the burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. So you see, it was, in, it was true in Elisha's day, it was true in Jesus' day, and it's true in our day. People, when you try to honor God, say, why this waste? Why, why do you worry about Jesus and give him doing that? Uh, Gehazi would have been right there with him. Um, Let me go ahead and move on here. Look at verse 22. He said, all is well. My master has sent me saying, behold, just now uh, two young men of the sons of the prophets had come from the hill country of Ephraim. So give them a change of, uh, give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothes. So here's some other things that are going on in Gehazi's life. He covets. He wants what somebody else has. He's a liar and he's deceptive. He's a con artist. And he's a manipulator. Now, there's a lot of that going on, again, in the world and in ministry today. And it's from the prosperity gospel that tries to get people to give so, and tells them, well, that's how you get healed and that's how you get blessed and, you know, it's an act of faith. I mean, it's, um, there's all sorts of that sort of thing going on now. And so you got to be real careful because people do lie and manipulate. It hasn't been that long ago on a Sunday morning. I can't remember if it was this week or the week before. I talked about Ananias and Sapphira. You remember their story, Acts chapter 5? Uh, they lied and manipulated, and they were really lying to God because what did they do? They said, we're going to give. We're going to give everything. And then they gave half of what they had and kept the other half hidden and kept it for themselves, and God struck them dead and killed them. Liars and manipulators, uh, coveting. And so... It, it was a problem there. You know, even Judas did what? He betrayed with a kiss, uh, a liar and a deceiver. Uh, people act and they play a part. But again, if you hang out long enough, what is going to happen? They're going to show you the true colors. Uh, look down at verse 26 real quick. Elisha said to him, did not my heart go with you when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money, to receive clothes and olive groves? Now, now, I'm highlighting this verse for a reason and jumping ahead for this reason. Do you remember, uh, not this Sunday, but the Sunday before? Jesus, I'm, I'm turning there real quick so I can get there. There was a paralytic man that was brought to Jesus. Remember, they put a hole in the roof, dropped the man down. He's right there at Jesus' feet. And Jesus says, 
my son. Sins are forgiven. Don't worry anymore. That's my words, but it's about like that. And then all the people in the room that heard him say that, what did they start doing? In their heart. In their heart. They said, this fellow blasphemy. And the Bible says, and Jesus knowing their thoughts. said, why are you thinking evil in your heart? Jesus knew something he could have only known had it been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. God, the Son, knew what was in their hearts. And the Holy Spirit of God does the same sort of thing back here with Elisha, doesn't it? Elisha wasn't with Gehazi when he went. Uh, he didn't see what happened. God revealed it to him because God sees and he knows. He's aware and God, in the right time, can let you know who the liars and the manipulators and the deceivers are. And that's what he does here, doesn't he? And so what Gehazi ends up doing is he ends up trading diamonds for dirt. He, he wants what he can have in this life, but he's like most of the rest of uh, the nation of Israel during that time, isn't he? Because the rest of the nation of Israel has traded the things of this world for the one true God. They've fallen down and worship idols. They, the rest of Israel had become like Naaman used to be. And here it is, Naaman, a Gentile, he became like what Israel should have been. So he asked, is it time? Is, is it a time? Is this a time for this to happen? No, it's not the time for it to happen. And so you get to verse 27 and then judgment comes. And that's what happens. And see, so it's not just with people in ministry. It's anybody. It's people in the church all around the world. There are people that claim to be Christian. They, they walk in your doors and they, they talk a good talk. But really deep down, they may be liars and manipulators and deceivers. They could be con men. They could be rebellious against authority and against God's word. And what's going to happen in the end? Well, he said, let the leprosy of Naaman cling to you. Remember what we said about leprosy? It's like it's like an outward sign of an internal thing. It's, if you wanted to depict sin in somebody's life, let, look at a leper and God will say, that's what your heart looks like. You, you got spiritual leprosy. And so for the leprosy of Naaman to come on him, it, it's almost like saying, hey, your sin is now stuck to you and everybody's going to see what, on the outside what you're like on the inside. Let the lepr leprosy of Naaman cling to you and your descendants forever. God judged him right then and there. And the sad thing was, his sin didn't just affect him, did it? Who else got it ruined over? All his children. You say, is it right for God to judge the man's children? Everything God does is right. Everything. God always does what is right. If it happened, it's because that's what should have happened. And God sees and he judges, and sometimes he judges the family too. And so there's a warning not just for us to be on guard against making decisions about two people too quickly because sometimes it takes time for the true colors to come out. And it's not just ministers, but it's all everywhere. Sometimes you don't see until you wait a little while. But eventually... If not in this life, in the next life, it'll come out. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that we could be here tonight and take this warning to heart that we need to be on guard. We need to be careful. We need to be loving and open and receptive, but at the same time, know that we live in a dangerous time. That this world's full of sin, and not everybody's real. God, help us to have discernment. Help us to have wisdom. And help us to walk in faith, trusting you in all things. God, we thank, thank you that you know and see it all. And thank you, God, that sometimes you reveal what's hidden so that exposure might come and we might be protected against whatever's out there that is hiding to destroy us. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you. Thank you for being the king of your church and the Lord of our lives. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. God bless you.